Because this is such a short um, event, the deal was right. um, no long biographical intro uh, intros, as as Juliana said, you're sitting on them. So we will plunge <laughs> right into hearing short opening statements from each of our wonderful participants at the panel. Then we'll have a little conversation um, you know, provoked by me. Um, <coughs> up here, and then we will open it as soon as possible to you and get your questions to the panel. So, Madame Marion, Marion <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased and um, I feel honored to be part of this um, event. And but I have to apologize. My English is pretty bad, and I have to uh, thank you. Patience and indulgence. Maybe I switch sometimes into German if I don't can explain myself very good. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was born in East Germany, in East Berlin, and I was growing up with the idea that uh, socialism is the only thing that could make life better. And uh, I myself was was a daughter of a politician. He was a deputy minister for cultural affairs, and he told me and my brothers, my other brothers, that socialism and democrat, democrat, democratic socialism is uh, the only way to make uh, people feel free and uh, equally, um, uh, to, to allow them develop themselves equally. And I believe that. And uh, I think in the beginning, the intention it was pretty good and it worked out in the 50s and then something happened, the Cold War came and it changed. Uh, the government would no longer um, follow this idea, but it would um, imprison and um, patronize its own people. And this was when my brothers, my three elder brothers, would stand up against my father, and people would stand up against the government, the East German government. I, it, it's a little abstract, but in a way, what happened in, in my family um, is, in, uh, how do you say, small, a, a small scale what happened to the country. So the uh, democracy changed and, and the German Democratic Republic no longer deserved the, the, the word democracy in its title. So that what I was thinking uh, um, when I was thinking of democracy. And then in 89, I mean, everybody knows, 30 years ago, people stood up against the government. And um, I thought it would be great if we would have the chance to, to try something new with this little country, eastern part of Germany. But uh, we didn't get the ch chance because it was sold to the West, to the West and uh, was just handed over. And, uh, Nothing happened. So, uh, what now? What we have now is a strong Germany, and we have a democratic system. But uh, I don't believe in this. Uh, and we see what happens around the world. We see what happened here. We have this weirdo at the White House, and we have a stronger uh, becoming movement of right, right movement, right, right hand, right wing movement, mm -hmm. yeah. which makes me really. Uh, but you are ahead with your rage, and I think we need in Germany we need more rage, not not rage against uh, immigrants, no. refugees, okay. but against what what happens on the right side of the political scale. So uh, yeah, it's a good good opportunity for me to think loudly about what what I think about democracy and what democracy looks like for me, and that's my statement. Siri. Yep, I think I have it. So um, these are uh, thoughts. Huh? When I marched in Washington the day after the inauguration of the malignant narcissist who remains in office, 
I felt a surge of, if not optimism, then at least solidarity <coughs> with resistance to the racist, misogynistic, xenophobic agenda that had been catapulted into office via the Electoral College. A hundred years earlier, the majority of those who participated in that march would not have had the vote. The 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, but consider that year, 1920. Jim Crow was entrenched, yes, but also the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in its second brutal incarnation, an organization that equated white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism with true Americanism. Let us not deceive ourselves. This is an old American song, the lyrics of which have returned again and again with variations throughout our history. Voter suppression, gerrymandering, mass incarceration of black men all undermine democracy. Trump is not the beginning of anything. He is the continuation. What does democracy look like? In Athens, the so-called cradle of democracy, only free male citizens were equals under the law. Equality is the first right in the 18th century, rights of man, as it is in the Declaration of Independence, but neither women nor slaves shared that equality. The Enlightenment agent of the 18th century, we have to remember, was a free white man led by his own rational faculties to produce a better and more rational society. Many scholars have noted the limitations of this idealized figure. Nevertheless, as soon as the thought of equality is out of the bag, arguments must be made for whom to exclude and why. Over a century before the rights of man, in 1673, the radical feminist Cartesian François de la Barre declared the mind has no sex. He was also radical in all regards, violently um, anti-slavery. He, he went the distance. This is 1673. Why exactly were women and or slaves unfit for equal status? Denis Diderot, the encyclopedist, was a vociferous opponent of slavery, but believed women were inherently unsuited for equal status in democratic government. It is good when we're thinking about democracy to remember that Aristotle's views on women and slaves are frankly pernicious. Huh? And that in the 18th and 19th centuries, the medical and scientific communities worked overtime to shore up sex difference and race as a form of predestination. And that these two often, but not always, went hand in hand. Indeed, these arguments of the more equal have not ceased. Evolutionary psychology is continually marshaled to prove that women are biologically unable to perform as physicists and engineers or work at Google. Behavioral <laughs> genetics has been summoned to argue for intrinsic race differences. Still, you know, the gaping holes, both rhetorical and scientific, often go unnoticed in popular culture. The evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker is a prime example. His sly sexism and racism cloaked in buoyant prose about fundamental sex difference, biological instincts, rape as an adaptive evolutionary phenomenon, racial IQ differences, and his fantasy enlightenment belief in progress slide right past every mainstream journalist I have read on his work. And those of us who have forcefully exposed and dismantled his ideas in print go entirely unnoticed. What does democracy look like? What would radical equality look like? We don't know. Few would want a direct democracy, I think, in which majorities can tyrannize minorities. Only a society that legally protects the rights of minorities is tolerable. 
But we are, I think, experiencing a resurgence of democratic agency right now. An agency fueled by outrage that must be used to vote the suckers out. <laughs> and advance a rhetoric that makes room for the many factions on the left. We are not a unified front, but who cares? Huh? What counts now is opposition. The problem with the news is that it's the news. The ongoing spectacle of a president with a severe personality disorder has led to endless chasing after belligerent tweets and bizarre behaviors that rise and then vanish within minutes. The fact that psychopathy, also known as sociopathy and antisocial personality disorder, exists is not the problem. Pathological lying, a lack of empathy and guilt, a lack of impulse control, and inability to plan for the future are features of a disorder that has been noted in psychiatry since the 18th century. The 19th century was called moral insanity. Very accurate. The problem is that over 60 million people voted for a man whose damaged character has been on full display since the beginning. And that vast numbers of white people, by no means all poor or working class or ruined by globalization, put him in office. This is what has been overlooked. We are talking about huge swaths of the US population, whether the Russians or Facebook interfered with the election or not. Trump embodies, in fact, an extreme version of Enlightenment man, minus reason. <laughs> but one that has been cultivated since colonial days, the old American fantasy of the lone, swaggering, unapologetic, white male pioneer taming the wilderness, cowboy or movie hero, guns blazing, cruel in his ambition but oh so admirable, a man dependent on no one who answers to no one but himself. This creature is, of course, a grotesque lie. Human beings are social animals. We are dependent on others to survive. Democracy is not, in fact, about loners. The police, not as the Greeks understood it, but as we can understand it, is a collective reality of mutual interdependence, an expanded notion of equality that allows for, but does, does not fetishize the individual. Instead, it advocates pluralism, expansive tolerance, the embrace of the many, and a radical equality with full acknowledgement of difference. That's it. Good evening. Good evening. So, I always have flashbacks when I'm uh, at NYU because I did my PhD here, and graduate school can be somewhat torturous. But I wanted to thank uh, Jair Plessy in the Institute of Africana Studies for inviting me to participate this evening. Um, you can see from my opening slide <laughs> where I stand on the Women's March. Uh, for many women of color, it was certainly a fraught moment, and this photograph perfectly captures um, some of the tensions that continue to exist uh, between uh, black women, white women, women of color, indigenous women, um, the majority group. But what we're meant to talk about this evening was the power of everyday citizens to effect change via protest and resistance individual approaches to activism and how to fortify democratic principles we rely on. And we were having a fascinating conversation upstairs and I was um, explaining how important storytelling is to me. I'm a writer. I gave up my job as a professor in order to write for children full time. I do dozens of school visits and campus talks. Uh, right now, I would say I'm an independent scholar and I focus on racial disparities in publishing. And one of the things I think it's really important to remember is that movements rely upon narratives. 
every successful movement needs really good and effective storytellers. And I think the right has done an excellent job at building a compelling narrative that has drawn people to their cause. And the left needs to do better. But one of the things that is frustrating about trying to do better is that everybody doesn't have equal access to the tools that would enable them to tell their story. So I always begin my presentations by asking audience members to consider which members of your community aren't adequately represented by the books on the shelves. Which groups have been reduced to a single story? I'm going to assume that everyone is familiar with Chimamanda and Rosie Adichie's TED Talk on the dangers of a single story. And what additional stories need to be told to accurately reflect this group? Now this is a graphic that represents statistics compiled, compiled by the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They annually read 3,400 books and then break them down by race. And this is what we see. Fewer than 1% of the books feature American Indian children, 2% about Latinx children, 3% about Asian Pacific American, around 7% black children. Look at that, more books are about animals and trucks and 73% of the books are about white children. Now when I'm in a school, I show this graphic and I say to the kids, is that fair? And of course get a resounding no. And I don't know if you've been in a public school lately or which schools you've been in, New York City schools are of course some of the most segregated in the country. Uh, but the majority of school aged children right now in the United States are children of color. So to have books like this representing majority white children is a problem. Now, we can look at the boy, the white boy on the far right. He's standing in a room full of mirrors that's meant to invoke Rudine Sims Bishop, an African-American woman scholar. Her metaphor that children's books are a mirror, a window, and a sliding glass door. A mirror lets a child see themselves. A window lets them look into another world. A sliding glass door means the divide between the reader and the characters disappears. Children are not voyeurs, simply looking at someone else's world. This is how we build empathy. When I think about school shootings, mass shootings, terrorism, right? In this country, the largest group of terrorists, white men, if they were reading different things in school when they were growing up, would they feel differently about the people that they're targeting? The white boy is standing in a room full of mirrors. He sees himself over and over and over again in every possible heroic role. And the children of color and the indigenous child, of course, have one mirror, each gets smaller and smaller, and they only see themselves as miserable. And we do see that when children of color are represented in children's literature, they're often shown to be struggling through something terrible, dealing with urban pathology. The biggest trend right now, danger of a single story, is the shooting of black boys by police officers. We need to do better. Now, the number of books about children of color has plateaued for a very long time, and then we had a sudden spike in the last couple of years. What do you think accounts for that spike? Obama. <laughs> That's always the most common answer. Obama did it. Wouldn't it be nice to give him credit for that? Um, so what's actually happening, the CCBC uh, also provides this chart. So we can see that the number of books here broken down by three bars, books by, books about, books by but not about. The number of books about African Americans has gone up. It has skyrocketed. <coughs> For 2017, the number was 340, but only 100 of those books were by black people, which means people who are outside of our community, who may or may not have competence in our culture, are telling our stories. If we look at the Asian Pacific American category, what we can see is that Asian Pacific Americans, two thirds of them, write stories that are not about Asians. They're writing about whites. And the message that sends, I think, to people of color and indigenous writers is, if you want to get published, write white. It's reinforcing the status quo. Another graph shows us the dotted line books about black people, the solid line books by, the number of books by black people is actually going down. And the 2017 stats, 340 books, I just mentioned that, and 100, only 100, excuse me, by African Americans. This is a graphic by Reflection Press. If we were to go by um, population, whites make up 61% of the population, but almost 88% of the books published for children. African Americans were 13% of the population, but we represent less than 3% of the kid lit creators. Why is this happening? 
Well, I'm going to return back to my initial slide <laughs> with white women taking pictures of themselves in front of the White House. Um, publishing is dominated by one group, and we know this because Lee and Lowe, a small multicultural press, did a diversity baseline survey with the help of a professor, Sarah Park Dolan, and what they found is that straight, white, cisgender women who do not have disabilities dominate publishing. They are 90% of reviewers. They are the overwhelming majority of editors, marketers. If we extend outward, white women make up the majority of teachers in this country. They are the majority of librarians. If we're thinking about what stories are making it into the hands of children, those books have to pass through the hands of a white woman. We need white women allies more than ever. If we're going to figure out what democracy looks like, white women, the majority of them who voted, voted for Trump. In Alabama, the majority of white women voted for, going for her. Right? Cecile Richards said it best, white women, you have to do better. We really need allies. We really need the people who have the power. And it's very difficult, again, that issue with narrative. Right now, with the Me Too movement, which was founded by a black woman, Tarana Burke, it is very difficult once a group has established their status as victims, when they are recognized as victims, it is very hard to frame them as anything else. And that is a struggle for black women, because when we look at our homicide rate, it's not police officers that are killing the majority of black women, it's black men. It is very difficult to have that conversation. It's very difficult for me to stand up, I don't get invited into that many spaces and say, white women, you need to do better because the policies that you've put in place specifically around publishing are hurting us. Mm -hmm. As a possible jumping off point for the three of you continuing the conversation, I want to throw out this idea um, that I've heard in, in all of your remarks. Um, let me try to sum it up this way. One trait of non-democratic, this is about democracy, one trait of non-democratic populism is the notion of a pure us against them. Whoever us is may change from country to country and context to context, but there's a commonality in non-democratic um, populist impulses um, of that there is a pure us that owns the right to society. And I think um, just as you were provocative about um, white women, um, I think we need to have some um, attentiveness to not um, making a mirror image of the pure us um, as against all those deplorables who, you know who I'm quoting, um, who voted for Trump. Um, are they one group? Are, are we um, essentializing them in the way some racists essentialize others? Um, and so to avoid that, I'd like to throw out the idea, again, that I heard in, in, all, um, in all of the presentations, that um, to avoid a pure us in this room, and to avoid demonization, essentializing, and homogenization, um, is to ask the question, and I hear I will quote the magnificent Reverend Joel Hunter, a white male evangelical, who said, the first thing you have to do to talk to anybody is to find out why the other side is for the other side, <laughs> and that that's the beginning of a conversation. Um, rather than to build a pure us versus <coughs> them. Um, and I think this is also a question of how our narratives are built. How, um, I love the image of the, um, of, uh, is there a glass wall? Is there no wall? Is there a window? Are we talking to people on the other side? Right? To find out what makes non-democratic institutions um, attractive to people. People vote the way they do, they act the way they do, because they are attracted to something. It looks like a solution. And so I wanted to throw that um, idea out as a way to generate, I'm going to push back 
um, as a way to generate um, you talking to um, each other uh, to be built on what you've already said. I have only uh, experiences for Germany um, and I still don't have an answer to uh, the question why people would, would uh, elect the alternative for Germany since those people are well um, well educated mostly and um, they uh, you have those of course the other side you have new Nazis and but uh, the majority of those people who elect this party they are they don't have to be afraid of something but still they vote for this party I don't understand why they are doing that so I, I don't have a, uh, an answer to that question but I ask myself and why, as you said, why don't we stand up and um, make an opposition? We have uh, oppos opposition parties and uh, we have a lot of people who, would, who could stand up, but as you hear, we act on Trump, uh, we don't react on, on or we go on march, marches, and we don't protest against uh, the policy uh, that we have a democratic called party in the parliament. And, uh, I don't have an answer, and I don't know. It, it, that's not a thesis, and um, I'm just helpless. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I think it's there are two things here, right? So um, uh, the word has been out there in, in the press. So tribalism is something that recurs in you know multiple historical moments. I mean, you see it happening over and over again. Uh, in sociology, they talk about in-groups and out-groups, you know, it's something that is just always happening. So I think making a distinction, uh, you know, this is something that recurs in written historical records, right? These tribalistic ideas about inside and outside, uh, dominant groups oppressing uh, other groups, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, the question is not to deny, you can identify ideas as pernicious without denying the humanity of the people who hold them, right? This is, these are two different things. I mean, I think when you talk about demonization, it's the other as horror, even though I think all of us, all of us people engage in all kinds of forms of implicit prejudice, all kinds of uh, inside and outside thinking. So we should be able to make our way without condoning the ideas. Those are different things. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So many of us, mostly within my peer group, I would say people of color were not surprised that Trump got elected. Right, and we are not surprised by the folks who are wearing the Make America Great Again hats because we've been living with them <laughs> for centuries. Um, so the election didn't, you know, turn the rock over and all the creepy crawlies crane came out. We've known that reality, and that's been our reality for a very long time. Um, I don't believe in trying to reason with Trump supporters, and I certainly don't try to do that. I think. What's, what's most important for our focus is, in some ways, for people of color, we still have to affirm our own humanity, right? So I'm not worried about dehumanizing you know, the folks on the right. I'm still here trying to affirm my humanity. And that has to be done through storytelling and creating these persuasive narratives that say, please see me, please hear me, black lives matter. And then people come back with all lives matter. And if we're going to talk about populism, you know, that's really everyday ordinary people pushing back against privilege. And I feel like in order for us to move forward, we really have to have a conversation around privilege, even on the left. And so this, this um, impulse towards homogenization, I think it's really dangerous for us on the left. And there was this sense that identity politics is the reason the left lost and you know the right is doing better at you know creating a rallying cry in other words you people of color and you disabled people and you queer folk you're to blame and if you would just all shut up and rally around us you know the dominant group then everything would be okay uh, I think we need to be able to have more engaged uh, and rigorous conversations around privilege and around intersectionality and we need to be able 
to demonstrate to people on the right, even if they're not going to listen, that they actually have more in common with a lot of us, right? Like this idea that working class people voted in a billionaire who has exploited so many working people and he just pushed through this tax cut that does very little for working class people. It's just, how has he been able to do that? How have they had such a seductive narrative? Um, and I think, you know, the core of rage is pain. So I can accept that people on the right are hurting, the people that supported Trump, feel themselves to be victims. <laughs> But they are also victimizers, and they should actually identify with other people who have been victimized by the structures that are in place right now. So I think, once again, coming back to this idea of narrative, uh, we have to be able to listen to other people's stories. I have to do so equally. I was really frustrated by the media coverage of white working class men and how white working class oh, men feel gosh. like a neglected group, right? <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Listen, there's a, this is a, a quote from a, a Dutch scholar who uh, I've read a number of his papers on white European nativist populism. And um, he was talking about a phenomenon that every time some a right wing uh, party gets power in Europe and also after Trump's election, that the media is all over, uh, you know, the sad state of you know, the working class and the, you know, the people out there, the, you know, the people out there on the plains. And he said a very beautiful thing, I think it was in The Guardian. He said, everyone has to remember that angry white men are not the people. <laughs> and, and, and I thought this was, you know, this because you see that the journalists jumped all over this, you know, and the Rust Belt, and it is not to say that people haven't suffered in the Rust Belt, but as I pointed out in my little uh, uh, talk, it was not only <coughs> white working class people in the Rust Belt who are responsible for Trump's uh, election. There were just as many people make over $250,000 a year voted for Trump as voted for Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton won the working class vote. Uh, so let us not distort this. Now why are these narrative distortions? This is what uh, you've been talking about. So these narrative distortions are precisely what play into um, the news, if you will. It's a reinforcement of these particular structures that, that, that we've been talking about. And, and I think, you know, if we can be as, as, as subtle as possible and to push back, I mean, what is the good narrative? I mean, what is the unifying narrative? Because I, I think, you know, I ended with this acknowledgement of differences. And those, that acknowledgement is about hierarchies. And, you know, as I've often been saying, you know, white people have to talk about whiteness. We don't have to be necessarily actually in a dialogue with black people sometimes, but we just have to talk about what whiteness is. Amongst yourselves. <laughs> you don't want to hear it. So what does that mean? You know, and what have so many of us, I mean, that's what Simone de Beauvoir said about masculinity, right? Which is that it's the universal. And, you know, I do think in some ways that the culture is m moving in a direction where, you know, whiteness is ceasing to be a universal quality. It's not a default. That's right. It's not a default position. And, and this I'm going to important. be rude. Go. Be rude. <laughs> because we have a room full of people and a short amount of time. Okay. And I want to make sure to start getting your questions for the oh, yeah. three um, panelists. So who would like to ask a question? It, it, uh, into the mic. Ask the question. Into the mic. Um, first, okay, we have a hand in the back. In the back. Well, I do not want my picture taken, so I'm going to hide from you in the top of them. Well, people usually avoid their fears, their hatred, and sometimes that's a question of skin color. Because as somebody, basically, uh, if you look at the uh, immigrant community, especially those who, uh, those who suffer from mental illness or HIV, uh, they may have a different view about things from uh, 
black folks who are not HIV and mental illness. Those are not issues that are being discussed in my community at all. As a matter of fact, if I tell you stories, what was done to me as an HIV person, it will make you, you, you will not believe you're living in the United States of America. And what, if I tell you story what happened when my sister who's living in an institution in Quidmore, it's in Queens, Quidmore's in Queens, in 1989, she got pregnant, she was eight months pregnant, nobody knew, she, they know, but we didn't know, I thought it was the psycho, psycho medications that make her ill. So it was when we found out that we begged the hospital to take her to a medical and we found out she was pregnant. That's how we found out she was pregnant and she delivered a healthy baby for God's sake. But there are a lot of things going on in New York City that we're not talking about. Yeah. And please, I would like these people to have some voice. The mentally ill, the medical uh, uh, people with HIV or AIDS or whatever other disability that uh, we are not we are afraid to talk about. In light of the time, maybe we'll take two or three questions and then let the panelists um, respond. So we have this question, and the next, there was more than one hand. Don't be shy. Yes? No? <laughs> okay. I, the question is about the prism or the interpretation through which all of us are being manipulated. and. You know, there was a presentation of slides about media and publishing industry, but when we talk about what people believe in America about anything, of any background, what is the prism through which this is being force-fed? And can we look back at history and see how it was done in other places before we judge our fellow citizens so harshly? There is some kind of elite control institution that is manipulating all of us. And can you talk about that? Can we have a democracy when this is alive and it hasn't been raised except for a few issues about the publishing industry? But, you know, what is really going on? The election, this election is just one example, but it's been going on for decades. And how can we have this continue? How, what does democracy really look like if we have an institution of media that is owned by private enterprise for profit, and we're blaming other people for what they believe. Okay, is there one more? And then we'll wrap this series with women down the front. Hi, um, I, I think you know, you're know you discussing the future of democracy, so to speak, but I, I think a lot of the elements have to do with fear, uh, fear of change, in this country because there is a lot of social change going on and also fear of uh, changing demographics. Yeah. The demographics are absolutely changing and I was looking forward to it, but it <coughs> seems there is a group, mostly what, elderly white men maybe, who are very threatened by this and they are not accepting it. So I think a lot of this in America anyway is, is the demographics that will change, but when we see it, you know, what's going to happen to our democracy. So we have HIV mental health, control of the prison through which people um, see the world, and the question of fear of change. And that's a very broad phenomenon. Do you want to weigh in anywhere? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I actually with the, uh, the, the mental health, I, uh, I was a volunteer in a psychiatric hospital uh, while Cornell, where I now uh, teach a seminar to psychiatric residents. So psychiatry is something uh, close to my heart. And, uh, and I think uh, the, this is also connected to, to story time, right? That the diversity and richness of multiple stories includes people um, in different positions. And I've actually um, uh, contributed to uh, changing the biomedical model to thinking about how environment makes you, can make you be part of the equation that makes people ill. So I just gave a lecture in Berlin actually at um, the Psychosomatic Society and the theme of the conference was unequal societies are sicker. Uh, there's an epidemiologist called, his name is Wilkinson, 
and uh, across the board, not just poor people, everybody is sicker, okay? So they're less sick in Sweden than they are in the United States. These are very interesting questions I, I think we, uh, that are worth thinking about. Why would that be that even people at the upper echelons of the society suffer from significantly more mental illness than people in more equal cultures? So I, I'm going to try to combine sort of the first and the second question, and then hopefully we can come back to your question about demographics. So the part of my presentation that I didn't get to was activism, and I'm going to try to end with some positivity. Uh, so when I found myself uh, with an award-winning picture book published traditionally, and then I couldn't publish 20 other manuscripts, a friend pointed me to print-on-demand technology. And that enabled me to publish my own books. I've published more than 20 at this point. We did just sell a manuscript uh, to Disney Hyperion on Friday, so I'm still using the traditional channels, but self-publishing uh, is a way in order to, uh, to get your story out into the world. And I can say I'm an immigrant, uh, I'm someone who lives with mental illness, I certainly didn't see the books that I needed to read as a child, and so I wrote some of those books and then I self-published them. Uh, and I do workshops to teach people how to use Create Space or Lulu or Ingram Spark to put their stories out into the world, and they don't need to have a whole lot of money to do that. In terms of the consolidation of uh, the media and publishing corporations, I think we should look for alternative platforms, and yes, a blogger can't necessarily stand up against CNN, but people increasingly are turning uh, to the internet to find not just fake news, but alternative platforms that have reliable sources of information. And I can say that as someone who self-publishes, self-published books often are denied review from the major outlets or they charge $500, but you have bloggers and you have bloggers and you have individuals who will say, you know what, that's the book I'm looking for and I want to talk about it. I was in Edinburgh at a publishing conference talking about these issues, racial disparities in US publishing, and I had a woman in Jamaica contact me to say she's running a book club and she's reading my books digitally and they're having a conversation about this text, which then connected to a reader in Toronto who said, I have a blog, we're talking about Afrofuturism and Black Panther and your writing fits into that. Can we have a conversation? So people are using the platforms that are available, the technology that's available, to push back. And I think that's really important. And could you rephrase your, your question? Oh, just the demographics. Yeah. The demographics in this country are changing mm -hmm. in, in terms of people of color mm -hmm. becoming more majority. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a pushback going mm -hmm. on against that. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's about privilege and it's about power. And people don't. There's always been a fear in this country among whites of Negro domination, right? That was the rise of the Klan. Uh, this idea that black people are going to take over and take control and then we will do to whites what whites have done to us. And there's a fear of the same thing that women are going to take over and women will do to men what men have done to women. Uh, I think it's important to note, though, that power uh, dominance isn't just about numbers. Right? Like we could get to a point in this country where people of color are the majority and we still will not have power because the dominant group is going to hold on to it as long as they can. Um, just to, I, I want to just bring um, Marion's position in just for a moment to also to note that you said um, that certain people are a sector of the Alternative for Deutschland or the Identitarian right wing movements have nothing to be afraid about and yet they are joining right wing yeah. movements. Um, but from their perspective, they might be afraid of something. They might be afraid of demographic change in Europe. They might be afraid of the future um, economically. Even because anticipation of deprivation and fear of future pain is equally powerful as a motivator as present pain. Fear of the future is very, very powerful as a motivator. And, I, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that from the German perspective. Mm, I was thinking about it. I, we don't know. I, I don't understand those people. I don't understand them. <laughs> Why? Um, they, are, they are well. They don't have to fear uh, anything. They fear... Um, maybe in, in, in another story came to my mind. Uh, 
I'm sure you don't have, maybe you have heard about it, about this um, guy, uh, a, a, a refugee, a Syrian, young Syrian, was attacking a young Israeli. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid of that because um, because that plays, uh, or wie sagt man, das um, spielt in die Hände. Right, yeah. It plays to the stereotype. It plays to the stereotype, right. and, it, uh, and they point to, uh, the right wings point to Merkel and say, it's all your fault. <coughs> you let them all in. So uh, we are not afraid of those people, and we are friends of the Jews. They aren't friends of the Jews. They don't care about the Jews. And uh, that's, that's what I really frightened me of. Uh, it doesn't answer your question, but uh, that's what, what I care about. Yeah. Let's see if we have more questions from the um, audience. We have one more round. Juliana, this gentleman, and one more. <coughs> Juliana, this gentleman, and another hand. Going once, going twice. <laughs> uh, okay, Juliana. I have a question for you, Marion. Like, um, the, obviously, um, you've talked about this, the question of democracy and, like, personal activism is on your mind and I'm just wondering what repercussions, what kind of consequences does that have for your writing or for your thoughts potentially about future writing when you, you know, you told me you're working on a children's book which ties in nicely with what you were discussing, thinking about the next generation, how can we inoculate, so to speak, them against what we were or some of us, and probably all of us on some level, have been infected by. And, and does that, do you think about this consciously when you write for the children's book, but also for you know, your latest novella? Well, how do you deal with these questions? And I think this yeah, gentleman needs a, a microphone. Although I was born in Queens, New York, uh, I've lived a very long years in two other countries, <coughs> which explains why I have an accent. And one thing that distinguishes we Americans from uh, other people I know is that we lie to ourselves. <laughs> I, I found uh, uh, the Sosted's uh, uh, talk very powerful, and, and, but we don't lie only about our history, uh, the nature of our democracy, we lie to ourselves. And uh, I worked for a corporation where a lot of people were either fired or uh, let, let go because the company was downsizing. And if you ask them, what are you doing now? And they would say, I'm uh, a consultant. <laughs> And I assure you, they were not consulting anybody. They just did not have a job, and they could not find another. And that, that will not happen in the other two countries that I know well. Right. And so there is something about the psychology of this country that distinguishes us from others. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have a mission when I'm writing, uh, I just make up stories. But I think uh, in, in, uh, in Wonder Moose side, in my conscious, unconscious, yeah, um, it's, all, it's, it's about injustice, it's about uh, being um, selbstbewusst, self-aware, but not so offensichtlich, not so obvious. But, um, Maybe it, it plays a role, but uh, I don't um, I don't intend to write a story now what, what's happening in Germany, or, or because uh, I care, but I don't let it too much in, in my in, to my th which is not right, I think. But w maybe we are not uh, not ready yet. I I belong to those people who still are waiting, and that's bad. We should stand up and we should uh, write against it. But I, I, I always read um, a lot of uh, stuff uh, from people that write against something or that have the mission to convince people of something. And, and um, But I'm not the one. Maybe I become one sometimes. Next life. <laughs> Tomorrow. 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 Any comment on the uh, gentleman's question? 
No, I think this is, you know, each culture, right, we have uh, these dominant myths or dominant narratives. And, you know, one of the ongoing narratives, probably since Benjamin Franklin, has been the self-made man. Uh, and this guy is born of nobody, right? In fact, Franklin underplayed the role of his father who was really important to him in that autobiography because the whole idea is that he made himself. This is a particularly American fantasy that may play into some of the shame narratives of those people who say they're consulting when they really <coughs> can't get a job. Um, and I find this to be stronger in the other country that I know because my mother is Norwegian. Um, there's a lot of Norwegian pride but this idea of being self-made, uh, that is not, you know, coming up by your bootstraps, all this crap. Uh, uh, that is not as strong in Norwegian culture where there is a, a different sense of the collective. Uh, and that's part of my inner life. And that goes back to historical denial, right? So that the United States is a country founded on stolen land and genocide against American Indians yeah. and stolen labor and genocide against African Americans. So you come up with these narratives, the master narrative, that justifies what you've done. And what you've done is create institutions and policies and structures that make it look like it's a meritocracy. Right? It looks like you get ahead if you just work hard and put your nose to the grindstone and pull yourself. We have all of these narratives that support the idea of a meritocracy, but it is a myth. And when people are forced to reckon with the myth, right? I don't have a job. I'm not bringing home six figures. What's wrong with me? Because the subtext of that is there are all these structures in place to make sure I succeed. If you're a member of the dominant group, certainly if you're a straight white man. So for some of us, we have our own illusions. I think I would say among African Americans, there's a certain kind of optimism that we are still you know, on this trajectory where things are going to get better. And you know, to hear President Obama say, oh, the next generation, everything's going to be better. Are you? Who's raising the next generation? Have you met those folks? So their parents and grandparents, you know, it's not going to die off. We really are reproducing a kind of dysfunctional narrative that just as Frederick Douglass used to say about slavery, slavery is, was as damaging to the enslavers, perhaps more so than it was to the enslaved. And when people hold on to the myth of meritocracy and won't talk about structures of privilege, they're doing an immense damage to themselves. And then they project that outward onto immigrants, onto women, onto queer folk. And that's how we end up in this cycle. The need for honesty I wish I could remember that James Baldwin quote. If anyone is here, I can remember it. Please, please help me out. But you know, I mean, he says, you know, nothing can be changed until it is faced. But so many Americans, they, they cannot bear to take off their masks. They simply can't because they hate what's underneath it. And then they project that onto other people, that self-hatred. So we have so much healing to do, we really do. And I do think narratives can heal. I do, that's my hope, that's why I write. The narrative that I'm going to talk and all of you um, in the audience and close with wise words on racism that racism doesn't stop um, until it is replaced by something else. Thank you very much.